Great. Well, why don't we get started? Um, uh, this is the message is the medium. We're going to have a conversation today about text messaging and mobile messaging and the incredible power that they have to engage audiences in a conversation uh, and the, the untapped, uh, in many cases, potential for how newsrooms can, can put text messaging to work in, in their organizations. Um, so I just want to do a quick show of hands. How many of you text every day? So everyone, OK. <laughs> that was a softball. How many of you text as part of your work? How many of you text on behalf of your organization? OK, so not many. So we're going to talk about that gap. We all text one another, um, but the organization to community organization to audience texting, there, there's a lot of potential there, but there are some constraints that we'll talk about. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit about <clears throat> why text messaging is so powerful, and a lot of these stats might be familiar to you. Um, text messages have a 99% open rate, and, uh, and many, most of those opens, 90% of those opens are open within three seconds. So it's incredibly um, direct and ubiquitous. It's pre-installed on every phone on the planet. It's the only app everyone on the planet has on their phone. 85% um, of consumers and audiences actually want to text back to an organization. And it's still, if you wrap in WhatsApp, which I consider a form of texting, it's the number one way to communicate on the planet. So it's, it's incredibly powerful and ubiquitous. Um, it's also inclusive and safe um, it, from an organization to the audience. Um, it, it creates a sense of loyalty, and it's an alternative to a lot of the other tactics that news organizations have used in the past to gain attention and to gain audience. Um, so it creates loyalty, it creates a direct emotional connection. Um, it, it creates not only safety for the person on the other end of it, what they're responding to the organization isn't being broadcast on social, but it also creates safety for the brand to have an authentic conversation. Um, it's direct. Um, like I said, it's ubiquitous, and that ubiquity allows, it, allows you to use it for outreach. Um, but interestingly, um, it's not only good for reaching the hard to reach, but it's also great at uh, super engaging your fans. So we'll talk about different applications of it. Um, so I'm going to give them a chance to introduce themselves in just a moment, but I want to talk about a few case studies uh, very quickly for how we've used, uh, at GroundSource, we've used text messaging, or our clients have used text messaging. Um, the Philadelphia Inquirer um, used it to create a text letter um, in the run-up to the last election. And eat, every day, they would send out a text to about 500 people with uh, information about the issues and the candidates. Um, and after that, that initiative, 83% of people said they would actually like more texts from the Philadelphia Inquirer, which, which was surprising. And they had a really high retention rate. Um, and they earned a few subscriptions directly through that, through that um, engagement. Sold in America is a podcast produced by Stitcher. Um, it's about sex trafficking in America. Um, it was downloaded more than two million times. And during each episode, they had a call out during the episode where you could text in and get a picture or a video or some bit of complimentary content. Um, and 17,000 people subscribed to those texts. Uh, they, then they also could broadcast out to that community, say, hey, the next episode just dropped. And they also used it to gather stories. And in, in, in fact, they created two entire bonus episodes based on the feedback they got through text messaging, and that included voice memos, texts, stories from people caught up in sex trafficking, stories from people who had been clients of, of, uh, in, in the sex trafficking and were telling their story for the first time through text message. Um, really powerful. Uh, and the Seattle Times uses it to engage audiences around these orca whales that are residing off the coast of Seattle. Uh, the whole city is captivated by these whales, and the environmental reporter, or environment reporter at Seattle Times wanted a, uh, a different and better way to communicate with her audiences. And so now she has a texting club of about 1,500 people um, who get these, these kinds of updates from Linda Mapes, the environmental reporter. With pictures, she'll go out in the field and take a video of the whales and text it to people. So it's like having the environmental reporter for the Seattle Times kind of as your friend, uh, you know, popping up in your phone periodically. Um, and she often gets 
feedback and stories and poems and pictures uh, back from the texting club participants too. And it, this has been going on for several months and they have a 94% retention rate, which is, you know, text messaging is quite direct and if you text stop, it's done. So it's quite, can be quite intrusive. So those, I think those are pretty impressive numbers. So I just want to give you a sense of why texting, the potential of texting is so great and talk about a few of our case studies and I want to hand it off to uh, our panelists. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Hannah. Uh, I work at Reveal from the Center for Investigative Reporting and we're a nonprofit newsroom based in the Bay Area. Uh, and we love text messaging. We have a, a radio show and a podcast um, and that's primarily how we use text messaging or that's primarily the platform we use it with. Um, and the reason for that is that uh, our radio show and podcast uh, audience, uh, it's hard to have a two-way conversation with them. We, were, we have a pretty large audience uh, and it reaches folks in, I think, over 460 communities all across the United States. Our podcast is downloaded millions of times a month. Um, but just because of the way that uh, broadcast and podcast technology works, it's not a great platform for a two-way conversation. Uh, and so we wanted to try to figure out how we could be connecting with that audience um, and how we could be um, uh, hearing from them just like we would our social audiences or our web audiences. We wanted that same opportunity. Uh, and so we decided to use text messaging uh, to try to connect with folks after doing a lot of experimenting um, at, uh, around like conversion if it was effective and we saw that it really was. Uh, but in, so the primary way that we use it, and I don't know if this is the example up here, yep, it is, uh, or one of the most exciting ways we use it is like an editorial companion to our podcast. Uh, so uh, we have our host uh, throughout the show, similar to, was it Sold in America? Or, yeah, Sold in America. Um, read out a call out, so you know, Al's describing something, He's uh, talking about, in this example, the state of redlining uh, in the United States, so like uh, lending and lending disparities. Um, and it, we invite our audience to text us for more information on that. So in that case, it was, they could use their, or enter their address, send us their address via text message. Uh, we would send them back uh, information about where like what lending looked like where they live, uh, so super personalized information, uh, and it would uh, gave us the ability to start a conversation. So then uh, after that would follow up with, well, what do you think about that? Or how does, you know, uh, has that ever happened to you or anyone that you know? And it's just a really effective way to start having a conversation. Uh, and we found uh, really uh, compliment podcasts because podcasts and, and radio are kind of an intimate medium. People feel really connected to our host, Al. They always say things like, in surveys and stuff, uh, they talk about him like like Al's their friend, and so they to be texting with someone is actually really complimentary. Uh, so we started using text messaging like that, uh, so as like an editorial companion, um, and uh, have like fallen in love with it because it does give us that that ability to reach out to folks. So Andrew was mentioning this, but uh, one of the great things about text messaging is it's like email. Uh, you can really control the uh, way that you reach out to your audience. So unlike Facebook or No Shade uh, or like uh, web traffic where you can't really control uh, uh, you know, the algorithms and, and the ways that audiences are finding you. Uh, with text messaging, it's like e it, it is like exactly like email, just a little different. Um, but you can reach out to people when you want to. Uh, they can reach out to you. Uh, and that conversation can just keep going. It's really reliable. So yeah, we, we really enjoy it. Uh, there's a lot of challenges, which I'm sure we'll get to. but. Um, yeah, primarily for us, it's a, it's a great companion to uh, our podcast and broadcast. Hi there. Uh, could I ask one question, actually, before I can proceed out of interest? Sure. <laughs> um, I'm curious, have you ever used kind of the ability of people to send in like short audio clips? Have you ever used that in conjunction with podcasts to like include that audio content within your podcast? Mm -hmm. We've used something like it, so yeah. we'll have people, they, we'll let them like call us and leave voicemails okay. actually, um, a, just for mm -hmm. different data storage things. But yeah, okay. it's really effective so that yeah. their voices can be heard in the, in the yeah. show too. Okay, yeah. great. That's fine. Thanks. Um, so yeah, quick intro. My name's Rachel. I'm from The Ferret. We're an a investigative journalism um, member-owned cooperative in Scotland. And I think we're one of the first journalism organizations in the UK to be, uh, sorry, in Europe rather, to be using text messaging technology to connect with our audiences and communities. So it's been very exciting. We got a grant from the Community Learning and Engagement Fund to experiment with Ground Source. Um, around about the same time, we were conscious that we had a kind of a decent but kind of 
narrow set of members. We've got about a thousand members who subscribe to us and are part of the cooperative. But we wanted to reach out to a wider audience, make more people aware of our stories. We also wanted to extend our geographic reach because, as you may know, a lot of the population in Scotland is concentrated in one part of the country and we want to be able to reach more people across the landmass. So what we created was something called Ferret Underground, which was a kind of a community out with our core membership of people who were interested and might consider joining the ferret at a later date or perhaps couldn't afford to join currently. Uh, and people who signed up to the Ferret Underground got a number of things. They would get a free weekly newsletter with rounds up of our stories, kind of other curated stories from, um, that, that we'd seen in our travels that we thought people would be interested in. We would have polls to get people's opinions on different stories. So that was one component. We launched a Facebook community group because our main Facebook page had the usual kind of pretty polarized commenting, um, a certain amount of hostility. We wanted a more constructive place that people could hang out. But then the third component was what we used the text messaging for. Um, so we set up a text messaging network with the members of the Ferret Underground. And we have used that kind of fairly successfully for a number of things. Um, so one is kind of administrative slash structural, which is our yearly AGM. So rather than having a very set formulaic AGM that only a certain number of people can come to, we made sure that people could kind of join in the process virtually. So we asked people in the underground network a series of questions about our strategic direction and how they thought we should work. Things like, um, should we accept ethical advertising? Because at the moment we don't accept advertising. Um, things about which media outlets our members and the wider community would be happy for us working with, kind of where their lines were. Um, so during the AGM, we got a lot of information fed in remotely and we brought that all into the, the process on the day. In fact, Mike, you were there, weren't you? You witnessed that in person? Yeah, yeah so I'm not lying, I promise. <laughs> um, another way we used it was um, membership puzzle and Jay Rosen launched a project last year called Join the Beat, which was looking at developing beat reporting in a more deep and engaged way um, with kind of audiences of expertise. Uh, we're very strong on environmental reporting, so we decided that we would develop the environmental beat more deeply. Um, so we used text messaging to do that by asking people lots of questions about the kind of subjects they'd like us to look into more. And once we found out what kind of subjects people were interested in, delve in a bit more deeply. Um, so that threw up quite a few leads for stories, but it also threw up the fact that people were absolutely desperate for environmental explainers. So while they really appreciated the news, they also wanted kind of evergreen content that talked about things like you know, recycling, how does recycling actually work in Scotland? Um, fracking, what does fracking actually do to the ground? Uh, because they felt that there was no reliable source of information that, that was un easy to understand that they could go to. So in that sense, this text messaging technique flushed out a couple of issues that we just wouldn't have known of otherwise and have allowed us to develop a new editorial strand. Um, I also used it for, I spoke at an amnesty conference the other day about how journalists and human rights organizations could work to, together much better to raise human rights issues to the public. Uh, we did a call out for that, which topics, human rights topics people thought were the most important. And that also flushed out a bunch of really, really kind of interesting topics, which I then took to the human rights organizations. And they've then taken back to kind of, kind of see if they marry up with their current focuses. Uh, so that's just a kind of a handful of examples of how we've been using the text messaging network. Um, there's some challenges too, but perhaps if I come to that yeah, in the next wave. Hi, um, my name's Paul and I work for an organisation based in London called On Our Radar and we specialise in working with, with marginalised communities both in the UK and abroad to find ways of shaping their own story in their own words. So from people with dementia and Alzheimer's and young homeless people in the UK to um, community reporters living through the Ebola crisis in Sierra Leone, people who've lived through slavery, covering the Nigerian elections, um, what we're passionate about is um, working with communities to help them shape the narrative and to help them tell their story in their own words. So how does this link to messaging? Well, um, the messaging for us is not always the medium for every single project, um, but the reason why we've come to using messaging, kind of SMS, WhatsApp and voice a lot is 
Um, when we're designing these projects with typically marginalized communities, quite hard to reach communities, then um, what we learn over and over again is that we need to go to the tools where they feel the most comfortable. We need to go to the tools where they feel most at home and um, chat with them on that kind of process. All of our projects, uh, kind of rooted in our projects, is um, um, trying to rethink how we can really listen to communities, how we can make those who don't traditionally participate in the media feel more at home and more comfortable, and um, how we can create this kind of dialogue with communities to rebuild trust in journalism, to rebuild trust in journalists as well. And so, um, how, how did we come about kind of messaging? So, one, one of our first projects, and a project we've been doing for a long time, is, um, is with a set of community reporters in, in Sierra Leone. Um, and we started working with them back in 2012 to cover the Sierra Leonean elections. Um, so, does anyone want to have a guess? There's, there's all this talk, I guess, about how you know, smartphones and the digital revolution is taking over the world. Does anyone ha ha want to have a guess how, how many, which percentage of, of people in Sierra Leone use, um, have access to the internet and use their smartphones for that? Okay, good guess. Any more? 95. 95? <laughs> Anywhere in the middle? <laughs> the, the answer's 13%. So it's you know it's pretty low. Um, if you if you if you're looking at kind of young connected audiences in Freetown, um, it will be much higher than that. But you look at a country-wide level of who has regular access to the internet, and if you want to design a project that is actually going to hear from different parts of Sierra Leone, from remote parts of Sierra Leone, from more marginalized communities, then having a tool um, like SMS um, that we built in order to hear their stories and gather their stories is a crucial way of making it inclusive and whether they, whether they have a smartphone or not, whether they have data at that time or not, SMS was a really powerful tool. Um, we, we use a tool called Radius, which is a custom-built tool for for, for, for using SMS for reporting purposes. And we also have a, a voice function on that, like a, similar to an answer phone, where people can call in and submit kind of voice reports to this line. Um, and that's also very powerful in um, um, a place like Sierra Leone, where you have maybe lower literacy levels and where people feel more comfortable um, articulating their report, articulating their experience verbally. So, the, the power of this also is, rather than this kind of parachute journalism where you jump in and out of places, um, we've been having that reporting line open and having that network open has meant that um, from doing that initial project in 2012 covering the Sierra Leone elections, we, instead of parachuting in and leaving again, that line was open. And with that reporting network, we carried on working on, on health stories and disability stories, working with the BBC, with The Guardian, Al Jazeera, other outlets who are interested in their stories. And then in 2014, the Ebola crisis hit. So um, journalists from around the world were struggling to get in to Sierra Leone. If they could get in, they couldn't really get past the you know, huge areas were quarantined, so they, they couldn't really get past outside the medical tents and the NGO workers. So we were able to get reports from all around the country using SMS and voice, which we were then pitching to international media outlets. Um, that work um, led to a series of documentaries we made with a range of European outlets, and now we're working on a new project with that network where they're submitting stories um, about, about malaria. So, um, that all sounds, that's all out in Sierra Leone, so that's kind of different, but does, it, does anyone want to guess roughly in the UK um, what kind of internet connect, smartphone prevalence rates are? 60%. Slightly better than your last guess. <laughs> <laughs> it's, been to the it's, about, um, it's about 70% as well. So, so again, this idea that everyone's connected in the UK, everyone's using, everyone's using smartphones or everyone's online all the time um, isn't really true. And so we, we found this um, with doing a project with people with dementia and Alzheimer's in the UK. So we were trying to design a project where um, they would feel comfortable to share their experiences. It's 
dementia is now the biggest killer in the UK, but journalists would often not think to include them as kind of community reporters because they think, you know, they, they, they're losing their mind or they're going mad. But we found um, by, by giving them a customized line um, that they could use um, basic handsets that we designed to call into, that um, um, they could submit uh, daily diaries of their experiences living with the condition um, and that we could then curate these and work with them to pitch those um, to media outlets around the UK. So um, I think our main takeaway from sort of five years of, of learning to work with these communities is the key thing in terms of building trust is in, is in kind of seeding power and opening up um, that process of, of listening to the communities. And in some cases, um, an offline workshop, you know, uh, a gathering or um, a, a kind of documentary that is crafted with them may be more appropriate for that particular community. You know, the SMS isn't a one-size-fits-all. Um, also, similarly, if you're working with a bunch of incredibly digitally literate um, people who are using Slack and Trello and all these other apps, and it's probably they may not want to organize their storytelling project on SMS. So um, I think the key for us in terms of generating trust and um, uh, generating dialogue and really listening to these communities is to, to, to design those projects with them in mind and think about the medium that they are most at home using. Great, thanks Paul. So talking about um, feeling comfortable, uh, I don't know if you're like me, but I don't often like to be the person with the microphone asking the question. Um, so we've designed something for you. Uh, so this is for the introverts in the room who don't want to step up to the mic. Uh, so feel free to message us. Rachel will be um, looking at our feed. Uh, I think we already have a few questions in from doing some promotion on Twitter earlier. Um, but while we're doing that, and if you feel comfortable doing so, text in, text in your question, or we'll have a microphone in just a moment. Let's talk about some of the challenges um, and get those on the table. Um, text messaging is a 24-year-old technology, um, which you know may sound young, but there's, it's, it can be quirky. Um, it you know compared to email or compared to just doing stuff on the internet, it, it is relatively costly, especially as you get to larger scales. Um, and if you're texting tens of thousands of people, it can get very expensive. Um, but let's talk about from your experience some of the constraints or some of the uh, the limitations of texting as a, as a technology. Anyone? <laughs> I, yeah, yeah, I'll go. Uh, so I think one of the things, like I was saying, we love texting because it complements our podcast, like the intimacy feel, so it feels really like one-to-one -one with Al, like you're just chatting with him, but that can kind of cut both ways. Uh, it's like a really regulated space in your on your phone. Uh, you don't text with like brands or people who aren't like your friends or family that much, so that's one thing where we've done a lot of the research on how many messages start to feel like spammy to people and it's like three and then people are like, why are you blowing up my phone? They get like really weirded out by that. So I think that's one of the things is we're used to, we're investigative reporting. We write like 3,000 word stories on the internet and then cutting those down into text messages uh, can feel a little daunting, I think. Um, and also having it, them not, and having it feel conversational too. I think using all of the the ways that you text, you want it to feel like similar to a text you would get from a family or a friend, like conversational, maybe some emojis even, and I think that learning curve, uh, and even just dealing with the type of content we have can be a little bit, um, yeah, it, that can be a challenge, the, the length and stuff. Looks like we have a question. Yeah. <laughs> so, how do you make it feel conversational so when you know you got the radio host you, he gets or she they get a thousand messages from their uh, audience and it's just one person does that radio host actually then like respond or how do you make it feel like that person is actually having a conversation with a thousand different people uh, without making it feel canned in their responses well it does feel a little canned maybe but we try our best it, it's so it's um it, yeah so Go back to. Sure. So we usually start out with like for a reveal. We'll start out with like you have to text in a keyword, and then we'll have our host Al send back like, "Hey, this is Al," and like a oh. selfie. So 
So like everyone's getting the same thing, but it's like it feels like something you might. And he's like, hey, it's great to hear from you. I'm in the studio this week, something like that. And then we, you know, one or two or three text messages at most, and then it's a question. And then they're sending something back, and then we're sending back a, a canned response, but something conversational feeling. So it's really about like not letting it go by too long. Uh, where you aren't letting them say something back to you. So I guess another challenge is like this is not like a distribution channel. So you don't want to just be like spamming people, here's what I wanted to say, and then not asking them anything. I feel like that would be a really uh, yep. bad experience in our, in, from what we've done. Yeah, I've, Do I've, wanna... yeah. yeah I'd add to that really quick. We found it actually can be a distribution channel. Um, Ooh. <laughs> yeah. Um, and we didn't think of it as such at first, but realized that um, if there's content, like there's one of our clients uses it for daily weather texts, um, and that's, you know, you get your weather forecast, but people text back to it, and when they open up and ask for, you know, questions about climate change, people respond like crazy. So it can be a way to create some routine in someone's life that, that um, if you, and, you know, they, they, if people don't get their weather texts in the morning, um, they get upset. So they rely on it. Um, but I do think, you know, I, we spend a lot of time encouraging people to use, you know, professionals to use emoji in their, in their text, and it's a funny conversation, but it feels very natural, um, and it doesn't, as long as you don't go too far in the informal, chatty, like, LOL direction, um, it can feel very natural and, <laughs> and quite conversational. The choice yeah. emoji. I think one of the challenges we face in terms of that is that um, um, often our responses are quite personal, and I think we, um, with our approach, we specialize in working with specific communities, and so we are actually getting to know those communities. We are actually building the trust. Um, that, uh, that work is quite personal, so um, because we're, we're trying to use these stories to, to generate stories rather than to kind of broadcast stuff out, so that is time consuming and would um, there are ways to take shortcuts and there are sort of automated responses and um, kind of bot style responses that you can use for a while but um, yeah after, at a certain stage once you're getting into the hundreds of people then um, that, that personal touch is needed and the, the other challenge kind of linking onto that is what you know what type of stories are we trying to develop using this kind of messaging I think for for breaking news, um, so for the Ebola crisis or for an election or something like that, it's perfect because this kind of short form micro reporting that you're getting from a range of communities all across the country rather than from the one place that your correspondent is stood in um, is, is really effective because that kind of breaking news um, scenario allows for that type of, um, that type of report to come in. It's, it's when um, you're developing kind of longer feature style stories or we've worked on documentary stories and things then um, y you know the, 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 the richness that you can get in a kind of SMS or an audio report is it has its limitations and so we use we use that form of dialogue for developing those stories further uh, and then going into the communities to work with them in that way. I just wanted a really basic, have, have anybody at the table thought about sort of the bird's eye view after you're getting a lot of these responses and everything, what kind of efforts have you taken to sort of look at larger trends about things like what types of messages draw the most responses, what topics, have you done any sort of meta level analysis there and what does that look like and maybe what are you hoping to find and what, what are you seeing? I mean I guess Andrew can give the big picture but from a kind of anecdotal basis in terms of our usage so far. Um, we have tended to find that it works best if it's for something that's, um, I guess it's a bit like what Paul said, something that's kind of time limited, that has quite a defined focus. Um, so if, it, if you use it too generally, um, I think people just sometimes don't know how to respond or you know, don't feel motivated to get back in touch with you. Um, so I would say, say that was kind of our experience. But Andrew, are there any patterns that you've noted? Yeah, so we, um, we have some clients that um, you know, we have one client that uses it for their, uh, it's a national radio show, and they have about 10,000 texting club participants. And they'll get back easily 1,500 or more responses to their call outs. You know, it's basically, here's who we're having on the show tomorrow, what questions do you have? Um, and that feels like there's a real point to it, like you're gonna be reading through these, and some might make it on the air, 
and even if they don't make it on the air, you're helping inform their decision around the programming, and it's a brand I care about, um, and it's conversational. So that kind of hits all the, all the criteria we've seen for really successful texting campaigns. If there's some kind of a feeling of connection between the brand, the host, the journalist, and the community, where we haven't seen it work so well is um, where there's a very institutional voice, or it's an institution trying to reach out to the community. Um, lots of air quotes there, because we've seen a bunch of those where like, we really need to reach out to this community that we're not having a good time reaching, and we want to use texting because people text. Um, and we're going to put some flyers up and then cross our fingers, and then they say, hey, it's not working. Um, and I'm like, well, what part of that? The whole, yeah, okay, so let's just take it back. Um, so there's, there's got to be some compelling reason to want people to text you, and it's got to be genuine. Um, and I think we've learned, too, that not every text has to have a question mark at the end of it. You don't always have to be like, hey, what's your experience? Share your story. It can be just, hey, this new episode just dropped today. Just thought you'd like to know. See you later. And people will text back if they feel compelled to, but you don't have to. So um, some emotional connection, a strong brand voice, um, a feeling of intimacy, and a real reason for wanting to text people. One interesting thing we have we've seen um, like this this year well starting last year we were asked to do a reporting project on disability rights but led by people with disability it was in Kenya the Philippines and Zambia and so instead of us kind of flying out and going out there we um, we uh, brought um, some kind of community reporters that we trained up in community reporting using mobile using SMS. Um, and voice to, to London, and they went back and um, trained their own networks of people with disabilities in community reporting uh, and decided which themes that they wanted to focus on, so like lack of access to jobs, to healthcare, um, and to, um, yeah, kind of infrastructural kind of issues. And um, what they did is they went away, and over the course of six months, they submitted um, about 400 reports on, you know, access bar barriers to access that they'd face there and issues they'd face there via SMS and um, th those all came in, were all tracked in by our system and we were able to look at those and think, um, okay, when we, the, the final product then we, we went to make was a series of documentaries, but we were thinking, okay, which are the stories which would kind of best reflect the experience of these and we were able to kind of filter through the data and say, you know, we've had 200 reports on like lack of access to school and we've had, you know, 100 reports on um, discrimination when kind of accessing healthcare, etc. So it's actually a really nice way in terms of making sure that the stories that you're working on are, are actually reflective of what this community thinks. You're able to kind of listen back, um, you know, tag and filter and try and then say to the community, well, from, from all your messages, this is what we're hearing. The, these are what we think the most interesting topics are that you're reporting on. What, what do you think? Um, and they're like, yeah, sure, that, that, that's about right. Um, and then you can kind of compile the stories based on that. So it's an interesting way to really like listen to a bigger crowd and hear what they're saying. Um, so Rachel, do we have any questions? Oh, yeah. Um, oh, sorry, on here. <laughs> like. um, there's a couple that have come in that I can read out. So one is, in your experience, what is the best way to integrate automated and manual messages? So I don't know who's feeling most confident to speak to that. Yeah, I see, I, so I think the, and maybe you've seen a lot of these little chat windows in the bottom right-hand corners of, you know, you go to book an airline flight or you go to your bank and it's the little helpful chat thing. Um, and you're not sure where the human starts and the robot, you know, uh, or the human ends and the robot begins. And that's actually kind of okay. Um, and we found that if, you know, we, you know our, our um, platform allows you to kind of toggle between one-to-many and one-to-one -one messaging pretty easily. And, you know, I, I was personally, because uh, they needed some help working with this podcast, just to respond individually to people. And the responses I got were just like, oh my gosh, is this Noor, who is the host of the show? Uh, and emojis coming in, and so-and-so liked this image. And, you know, they weren't sure if it was me, or if it was the host, or if it was a robot, but um, it felt natural. Um, so I do think it's important to have 
to not, you know, not just be a, a one to many and then you don't do anything with the responses. I think it's important to thank people and to send them a nice emoji back or something just to know that they're being listened to. Um, another question is, how can messaging be used to allow us to work with audiences more meaningfully and collaboratively? So, I mean, I guess we've touched on kind of some of those topics already, but is there yeah. anything people would flag up that we haven't already? Yeah, I think just to add to that is just, it's a, um, I think kind of working with messages like before, we always wish that, um, you, you know, we always wish that we could just, imagine we could just hear from loads of people that we're working with who are interested in that issue or are experts in that issue, or, you know, all at the same time. And actually, as a listening tool, it's amazing because we can, we can ask questions, both personalized and in bulk, and um, we can set little challenges and um, we can very quickly kind of hear back. And it's a broadcasting tool that, you know, actually the large majority of the world has access to now. So it's in terms of that collaboration and in terms of kind of really listening, really creating a dialogue and really um, working on stories which reflect what those communities want, I think it, it, it's really powerful and it's, and it's not being used enough yet by, by media outlets. We've seen it used really effectively as kind of a help desk, um, especially in, in when you know with elections where people have a lot of questions about where is my voting booth or you know what about this candidate and um, you know being able to give people that both understanding what are people confused about what are their concerns kind of at scale but also being able to deliver one to one kind of support to people um, we've seen that work incredibly effectively and. Uh, we're going to be doing a lot more of that work in the, for the upcoming elections. We have a new question that right. has just come in from a mysterious member of the audience. Um, asking, what are the opportunities to monetize this? Oh, okay. Money, money, money. Um, what? This is money. That's yeah. Money. Well, well, I was gonna, this is one of the challenges to tech, and I think we've mentioned it. It can be, text messaging is expensive. You have to pay per message in a way that you don't, obviously, with email or other ways that you're connecting with people online. So I think the monetization question is real just to cover the costs of it. We've been experimenting a lot with it around like our membership kind of audience funnel. Um, so just thinking about how we connect with people on our podcast, we text with them and then potentially ask them to become members. Um, and it's, yeah, it's successful. I think it's just, again, you're not dealing with a free medium, so you're also having to offset those costs. Yeah, I think that's the, the biggest opportunity I see is, is one of, activating audiences um, and I said before you know it's incredibly effective at both outreach but also identifying who your super fans are who your core community is and giving them a special experience with the news organization and being able to activate them and convert them into supporters subscribers or if you're a nonprofit to really be able to demonstrate impact directly uh, you know we've seen data from a number of our clients and nonprofit clients where you know, 80 plus percent of people who get the text have shared those texts with someone else. 100 percent of people in one case were going to change the behavior because of this text ca texting campaign. And that's golden for, uh, you know, foundation funding to take that, not only the, that data, but also the testimonials, the real stories, the real voices of people to a, a funder and say, this is the kind of impact we're having. This is the voice of the people who, who are being affected by these things. So I think there's incredible potential for using it as a conversion tool and a funnel tool. Um, and as a way to demonstrate and increase your impact. Yeah, one, one thing I'd add, which isn't so much on kind of monetizing, but on potential savings, is that um, depending very much on, you know, I think that if, if, there's a, if you're reporting on a breaking story that day, um, and you've got to go and get a news program out by seven o'clock at night, then you probably won't have time and the kind of investment to put into it. But um, with news organizations who are working on a sustained basis with communities for a long period of time, for a year or two years, or for, um, to, to go back to the Sierra Leone exa example, for example, if you've got an Ebola crisis which is gonna, um, gonna last for a year or two years, then um, what a lot of news organizations do, and not just news organizations actually, but NGOs and research organizations, is they'll, they'll spend thousands on, on flying out and um, going out with all the kit and all the stuff and they'll get their stories um, and then they don't leave any platform behind and they come back home and they've got their story but um, after that 
they're stuck, and unless they they have to unless they've got 10,000 or 20,000 or whatever it's going to cost to send out a production team again, then that dialogue has stopped and that. Um, so in terms of kind of making savings, I think if people can identify longitudinal projects, longitudinal stories, communities that they're working consistently with, then that kind of upfront cost of, of you know, setting up a kind of messaging system and of, of maintaining that dialogue can pay itself back with, you know, um, a host of stories which can, can percolate up and which can flow in at any time. I yeah. think, sorry, one other, ahead, one other comment. We also, I mean, we also use, use text messaging as a kind of funnel function. The Ferret Underground Network is to bring people closer to membership in many ways. Um, but I think it also gives us the potential to reach communities that perhaps wouldn't engage with us so closely otherwise. Um, so one case in point is um, this kind of communities of chronic disability in the UK, many people are housebound or bedbound even, um, and we've been looking at how we kind of build up specialisms in those subjects um, and encourage more dialogue with those people who can flag up which are the issues that are really, really affecting them that we can then take to stories and that potentially will also increase our membership but serve a community that at the moment isn't getting served really much at all. Um, we've got another comment and another question. Are we out? How are we doing for time? No, we're fine on time. Yep, okay, cool. Um, someone has just asked, am I an idiot for thinking that you just had to send a message instead of a question? No, you're not an idiot. Um, <laughs> we think because it's a UK number and we're in Italy and there's various things going on with the network, so some messages are maybe not getting through. You're not an idiot. That was what you were supposed to do. Do not worry. <laughs> no, you just, you just grinned and waved when I read it out, that's all. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then we have a nice question, which is, um, yeah, I know the answer for, but it's a good question. If text messages are expensive, why don't you use WhatsApp for the same function? So, you can tell us that. So, WhatsApp, you can, as an organization, you can be in that space sharing links and being present as a, a brand or as a news organization, but you can't do the kind of automated two-way messaging and pulling those messages into a feed, building broadcast lists and segmenting those. You can't do any of those things in WhatsApp because they, for, they forbid third-party integrations. They right now have a business API that they're kind of rolling out uh, slowly, um, and they've said very publicly they want to maintain the kind of initial, the original spirit of WhatsApp, which is as a peer-to-peer -peer communications tool. And you can imagine, you know, if you're, you know, we're all nice people here, I think, um, but there's a lot of nefarious actors out there. I mean, talk about misinformation opportunities. If you got a broadcast list of tens of thousands of people and you started blasting links out into those, you know, um, into that environment. So they're, they're being very controlled about how they let brands and organizations into WhatsApp. They're exploring it because they have to monetize WhatsApp or they, they think they have to um, because there's really no business model to it otherwise other than sucking all your data in. Um, sorry. Um, <laughs> going down a rabbit hole there. Um, Sorry, pulling back. Uh, no, we've, we, we hacked an integration with it a while ago and it worked really well, but it's, you know, fair boating. Mm. Oh, oh, go on, yeah. Sorry, there's another question that's come in. And all these oh, could I just respond to that? Yeah, yeah, of course. I was just going to say, um, for us, um, uh, apart from, you know, the stats that I gave about a lot of people not having smartphones being the first answer, but the second answer is, you know, we, we do design stuff with communities and if a community that we're working with, if we were working with a load of 17-year-olds and they're all on WhatsApp and they wanted a WhatsApp group, then absolutely why not? You know, it's free to set up, it's cheap, and it allows a different form of engagement. So if, if we felt that kind of medium was, um, was the most appropriate and cheap to set up, I think it's an amazing tool. And especially as a reporting tool, you know, with the groups, it makes it very easy to triangulate what different people are saying. Someone else can report something in the group. You can check with someone else who's in that same community to see if they've um, um, heard what they've said. The audio function is, is really good with a bit of basic training people can actually you know, we've had people send us in WhatsApp audio in a quiet place, and because it's sent over the internet rather than over phone line, um, we've kind of then submitted that to BBC Radio, who've like broadcast that back to Africa two hours later after. So it's an amazing tool, and you can share kind of pictures and other things on it, um, but just worth remembering um, that you, you can't, as, as Andrew said, you can't customize it easily because of the API, and that, you know, not every community is on WhatsApp, so... 
Yeah, there is another question, which is a good one, actually. Um, has anyone experimenting with voting or gamification using this tech? Anyone here? What was the first one? Voting. Voting. So, like, polls oh, and yeah. stuff? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of our clients use it to do polling uh, of a sort, you know, choose one through five, um, and to kind of get basically a hand raising kind of thing. Um, we have not used it for gamification, but I could, I could, we've, we've talked about it, you know, having like scavenger hunts or different kinds of challenges that you could, you know, send people a, a little push or a little nudge to say, here's your daily challenge, here's your daily, there's, there's a lot of research about how text messaging it's actually an incredibly effective nudge. I don't know if you know the, the book or the concept of nudge, but basically behavioral change through little incremental bits of information, like getting college uh, or high school kids in, in poor areas, um, encouraging them to apply to college, and they've shown you know, really statistically significant uh, impact on you know, improving college admission rates amongst poor populations just on the basis of a daily text message about, hey, it's time to do your applications. So I think there's some there's a lot of power to that that the intimacy the directness of it that we could you know explore and gamify. Are you aware of anyone who's used it to do storytelling? Oh kind yeah, journalistic plenty. storytelling. Yeah. Yeah, and that's I mean we've we've created some what what would I think typically be called chatbots with clients where um, you know you break up in like a choose your own adventure style uh, a big story and you say what do you want to do next I want another chapter I want to go deeper I want to learn about this thing. Um, and that is incredibly effective, and people love that kind of like that, that guided tour. It's also a lot of work to set up, and you should. I mean, I wish I had it to show the spreadsheet of how we had to, you know, like how we basically the CMS for the content ended up being this really big spreadsheet. Um, but if it's you know if it's uh, a way to bring your audience in, and you've got enough capacity, and it's an important project, I you know it, it I could see where that could be really effective. That sounds so. Yeah, yeah we've done fun, <laughs> we've done fun bit, little bits of like gamified community reporter training where it's kind of like, what do you want to report on? One, infrastructure, two, health, three, school, and then you, they get set a challenge and then they get set a reporting tip and then they report back and that kind of stuff. And that's quite fun for yeah. remote engagement. And, yep. and we've experimented using uh, GIFs or GIFs. What's the opinion GIFs. here? No, yeah. sorry, GIF, okay. it's totally GIF. Um, to do uh, explainers, so to, to kind of space them out so there's the images load slowly enough that you can kind of absorb the information. Um, but like an explainer about how to vote or how to do something that's a little bit complicated, you could use, you know, there's a lot of creative ways you could use visuals as well to, um, to inform people and to engage people. I, yeah, there's so much potential here that yeah. we haven't even scratched. We're about to put a call out for what people think that our next inv investigation should be into, and we're gonna give them like a multiple choice menu, and it, you know, it won't be the absolute defining um, you know, decision, but basically it's gonna inform what we decide to go and do next, and we'll feed that back transparently as well. So. Yeah, the one thing I will mention is there's a big opportunity if you have a data team or you do a lot of data journalism with texting to connect that database that like we did with our redlining uh, data uh, and it can feel kind of gamey or special or personalized. So if you are a data journalism shop, it can be a really cool integration that helps people connect with that data in a way that they really can't otherwise or that they can through like maybe an app or something. Um, but just it's, it's really, it, it can feel really, uh, yeah, really special and really unique because you're getting data that's usually customized by like zip code or neighborhood or something is what you would be pulling down to send people um, based on what they're sending you. So that can feel kind of, I think that's the closest we've ever gotten to like a gamey yeah. feeling type experience. It's not like a fun game though. It's like, <laughs> want to know if there's lending disparities? It's like not maybe a game you want to play. But, yeah. Any other questions? I think this is an introvert room, though, because we've gotten like all questions on that. I know it's great. I mean, we use this a lot <laughs> at events for that for that reason. Mm. I wonder, yeah, interesting. Um, well, great. We're just about at time. Unless there's any other pressing questions, feel free to message that phone number if you have more questions, or to come up and chat with us afterwards. But thank you. Appreciate it. Oh, we've got another question now. <laughs> it wasn't. That's a good question.